here today, a person who's lived in Los Angeles for quite a while, and uh, we're just going to ask him a few questions about his life in the world, in the world of music and in Los Angeles. So, Joseph, why don't you just start by telling us somewhat briefly what you do musically, how you view yourself in this musical environment of Los Angeles. Well, what I do, I teach music, I perform music, I compose music. I have taught at a collegiate level for about 25 years. And I've been playing for about 50 years. I uh, currently enjoy a, a relatively successful professional career playing with uh, various uh, symphonies in and around the Los Angeles area. And uh, I'm teaching, I teach at three schools, and I've had some very successful students. Currently I am, uh, I am in the autumn of my career, as they say. The golden years, I guess, uh, if one were an optimist, it would be categorically termed. How golden? I'm not really too sure. Not really too sure. But I'm enjoying myself. I've worked with uh, the interviewer for probably around 40, over 40 years various ensembles and various projects. Let me interrupt you for a moment. So you say you've played for 50 years, so how old are you? I am 58 years old. 58, so you started playing really early. Well, I started on an instrument, whether what you call, whether that was playing or not, or performing, or whether my music made any sense is another thing. Uh, I'm still trying to find out what sense there is of it. I went back on uh, yesterday, even yesterday, and I'm not sure if it made any sense. You mean 24 hours ago? Uh, exactly. Hmm. Less than that, last night's rehearsal. Ah. Did it make any sense? Oh, well, we'll get to that, perhaps. Now, you, your instruments now, you're a percussionist. That's now. correct. Percussionist, drummer, keyboardist, as in melodic percussion. When you were eight, nine, when you started playing, were you, were you, uh, were you playing drums, percussion? What, what did you start on? I was playing uh, the cello. Oh, the cello. Violin, cello, correct, and uh, in elementary school. How'd that happen? Um, I'm not entirely sure. All I know is uh, I was in a string program and uh, a man, Mr. Weatherby, was the uh, teacher who made rounds at the various elementary schools. And for some reason, I began playing cello. And uh, I liked it well enough, I guess, but I didn't want to continue with it. I wanted to play guitar. And he says, well, we don't use any guitars here, so uh, if you don't play cello, there's nothing I can do for you. So I built I didn't play an instrument for about a year, and I went to seventh grade. That's when I started drums, percussion at uh, Gompers Junior High School. At Gompers. So when you started cello, you were in Los Angeles too. Right, I was uh, elementary school. Were you born in Los Angeles? No, I was born in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh huh. And when did you move here? 1962. 1962. So you were how old? I was uh, seven. Seven. Uh, and I was in second grade, and we moved to California. Why did your family move here? Um, uh, you know, that's a good question because uh, to my to this day, my mother talks about how she how much she hated moving, how much she hated leaving the Midwest, uh. and that my father 
basically uh, said one day we're leaving. We're coming to California, you know, we're going to California. So I'm not sure the motive. I know his mother was here and his sister was here. So I'm sure that has something to do with it. You know, as I piece these things together years later. And I imagine that when he was playing, he was a musician. He was a musician. What did he play? Trumpet. Uh-huh. And he played. He was a here. professional musician. He was a professional musician. Um, I Early in his life, or in the 20s, he, he played um, with a saxophone player named Earl Bostic. So I guess they toured. In in the in his twenties or in the twenties in the nineteen twenties in his twenties like uh, the early fifties uh -huh. early nineteen fifties he was uh, a member of the Earl Bostic band and Earl Bostic was an alto saxophone player was that a big band or a was combo, like a combo or like a quintet or a quartet or uh, maybe a little larger than that uh, I can't really. I'm not sure the instrumentation. I know there was alto sax. I know there was tenor sax because my father and John Coltrane were roommates. They were? Yeah, in that unit. Really? So there were at least three horns, yeah. Wow. And, uh, That's news to me. Of course, I don't know everything about your life, and there's no reason why I should. I'm spilling my guts. <laughs> I'm spilling my guts. So there may be other things that come forth a little bit later. Did your father talk about being roommates with Coltrane much? Uh, it wasn't like a, not really. I mean, he never talked about it like, um, like if people would brag or something because it, to us it's sort of impressive. Yeah. You know, but maybe a couple of times, a couple of times he mentioned it. Um, Did you ever ask about it? Not particularly. I didn't, you know, I didn't ask the things I probably would have asked now notice anything about like Coltrane's genius or um, his at the very least his you know his brilliance uh, so they, he really did, never talked about it you know uh, much he was just another a guy I guess another roommate and uh, but I think that's how he found out about California because um, I imagine they toured must have been here at some time, either passing through when he was touring or passing through on his way to um, to uh, the Korean War in the early 50s. So I'm sure that just goes back to how, why he moved him from Indiana. So he served in the military. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. In the Army or what, what branch of service? He was in the Army for... Uh, like two distinct periods. The first, he was a teenager, and he lied about his age to get into the service. And Why did he do that? Do you have any idea? No, he, I think he just wanted to get away from home or something, just something to do. Who, was he in the band? Yeah, he was, in a, he was in a band. Both times? No, the second time, he was called up ah. because he was in the... Uh, Reserves, so that when the Korean conflict broke out, he was called up to uh, to be a truck driver. Uh huh. And that's what he did. On the front or behind the lines, or uh, not sure. I mean, it was probably behind the lines. You know, probably hmm. uh, just making deliveries. Or did you not talk about it much? Not a lot. You know, maybe a story here and there. By watching um, at night, seeing the tail lights of another truck go off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess if you have memories like that, you, you, you kind of don't want to discuss it. You know, so. Oh, that was very funny. Not too much. That was very funny. You did service too. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, you were in the army. I was in the army. Early 80s, and I was in an army band at uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Are you glad you did that? Oh, uh, I'm glad it's over. Uh huh. I remember when you joined the army. Yeah. You had been working at Zodi's. Yeah. Remember Zodi's? Yeah, I remember. Not everyone will. No, 
No, but it's, uh, that's you know, kind of gone. Tell us a little bit what Zodi's was. Well, Zodi's was a, uh, what they call it a discount department store, it's sort of like what Target is today. Uh huh. And um, it was where I had, I guess, my first uh, sort of uh, real job uh, as far as being on the payroll and having taxes taken out. Those types of things. What years were was this? Uh, that would be like seventy three. I worked there from about seventy three until about seventy seven. A oh, long time. Uh, yeah, for about four years, and I quit. Was that part time, full time, or part time? Uh huh. What What were people paying an hour back then? For that uh, kind of minimum wage when I started was a dollar sixty five an hour. A dollar sixty five an hour. One sixty five an hour. Is that what you started at? Yep, that's where I started at. That's truly astounding. That's, uh, that's 40 years ago. That's 40 years ago, this past July is when I began working there. How are you so clear on that? Do you just do numbers that quickly in your head? Or no. do you have celebrate remember, anniversaries of freedom? I just remember, well, I know I started in 73, and I just remember what the minimum salary was. Uh, it was 165 an hour. Ah. Oh. And uh, I think after 30 days, you you got, it was like a probation period after 30 days, and they had gone to something like $2.10 an hour or something like that. Uh -huh. Once you joined the unit, you could join the union, and then it would be uh, about two ten an hour. And maybe the most I ever made there was about maybe four, four or fifteen an hour or something like that. Wow. That's, um, I mean, I guess I was making the same kind of money. I just don't have the memory. It's, uh, it's a long time ago, but it's just something that, you know, I just, just remember is kind of distinctive. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess I've come a long way since then. Probably so. Most people would uh, probably think so. Yeah, I, I imagine so. One would certainly <laughs> hope so. Well, in certain ways, in some ways. Yeah. You know, at, least, at least, I guess, income-wise to some degree. Mm-hmm. Now, your father played with Count Basie, right? Well, he played with, uh, yeah, he did a short stint with Basie in the early 70s, as far as I know, like in the early 70s. Uh, a very short tour. He did about a year with uh, Ray Charles at the same time. Uh huh. Uh, and that was, he took a year, because he took, taught school, he was mm -hmm. teaching school, and he took a sabbatical. In like 71, 72, he was, uh, he did like a Euro European and Mid East tour uh, with Count Bass, uh, sorry, with uh, Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. He taught music in the schools? No, he taught general elementary education. Ah, ah, okay. So he went to university? Yeah, he went to, uh, he got a BA from uh, Cal State. And then prior to that, Cal State Los Angeles, Cal State LA, yeah. And then prior to that, uh, he went to LA City College, and then he went to a couple schools in Indiana. Uh huh. Uh, they have schools in Indiana. Oh, uh, they do. Yes. Well, there's Indiana University. That's the tuba tuba school of the world. IU. The farm. That's amazing. Really, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now, so your father was a musician. Were you encouraged as a kid by your family to uh, play music once you showed an interest? Uh, or were they somewhat against it? Or? No, they weren't against it. In fact, we had lessons. You know, we went to Grant's Music Center. We? You're talking about your siblings? Yeah, my sisters, my two sisters, and myself. Uh, I took drum lessons, they took piano lessons. Uh huh. So I was encouraged to that degree. Do either of them play now? Do any of your siblings play? Uh, no, none of them play. Not even for their own entertainment? No, they, they've got smart. They wised up. And uh, although they, they really, uh, they lament having stopped lessons. Ah. They wish they had been forced. Uh, that's what they say now. That's what a lot of adults say. When I talk, I talk to people and most, a lot of the people I talk to, I won't say most, but a good number of them, they regret having, uh, not keeping up with their instrument. Uh-huh. It's, it's interesting um, 
when people speak about that, as you, your words were, they wish they had been forced. You know, that's, that's, um, it's curious that someone would have to be forced. I mean, maybe perhaps that's part of the difference of people who end up as adults playing. They, they don't have to be forced so much. Yeah, there's some, uh, you have some inclination towards it or, you know, there's something about it that you like or that you, you know, you uh, feel good about, um, I think, but they were kids and I guess, you know, the practicing or just, you know, it just really didn't interest them mm -hmm. like it interested me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, I mean, I didn't really work hard at it. I didn't practice a lot, but I would play um, in like the school ensembles and the police band, which we were in, LAPD junior band. Just, I could, I would play. And uh, mainly I was, uh, I guess, tolerated. I could read. Reading music wasn't, you know, I wouldn't say it came natural, but it wasn't a really difficult process. Uh, it wasn't until I was like about 19 when I really started disciplining myself to uh, to getting better through inculcating uh, my studies, you know, repetition over and that kind of practice. So it sounds like um, when you were in, say, junior high school, or perhaps even early high school, perhaps you didn't uh, see your future as a professional musician, or did you? Well... I did not particularly. You no, know, I thought of, uh, you know, maybe like something like social studies or, you know, uh -huh. teaching something like that or along those lines. Like at high school level, level yeah, or? Maybe, you know, high school or, uh, you know, junior high or. I just didn't really envision a, a professional career as a musician, partly because I didn't understand what that entailed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Even with your father being one. Yeah, well, yeah, because he wasn't, he played music and he played, like he played with the Motown acts when they would mm -hmm. come to Los Angeles, you know, and uh, do shows. But he, You mean like the big acts, like the Supremes, like uh, uh, Smokey and... Supremes, uh, Stevie Wonder, Temptations. Ah. Uh -huh. And uh, when they did shows in L.A., he would... You know, he would be playing first trumpet. You occasionally do shows like that now, do you uh, not? I haven't done shows like that actually in a, in a while. I mean, I've done shows with uh, Gladys Knight and Aretha Franklin. Uh -huh. Last time I worked with Aretha, maybe about 10 years, 10 years ago. But I've done uh, those kind of things. When you do those kind of shows, uh -huh. do you ever, when you're standing there saying, oh, you know, my father did this. This is kind of hip. Uh, this is kind of interesting. In a way, you know, I mean, in a way, maybe not particularly, you know, at times I think like that, but there are times when I, you know, wish we could have conversations now about music mm -hmm. because I understand it so much more, especially mm -hmm. like bebop. Uh-huh. Bebop and big band, which were two which genres, they just weren't part of my... Uh, the music that I listened to growing up in you know, my formative years, I guess, as they would say. What did you listen to? I listened to uh, R&B, uh, soul, you know, and maybe like rock, some jazz. But I wasn't really, my father was really part of the big band, the uh, you, you know, world environment. I mean, because that, when he was growing up, that's was the primary vehicle for uh, popular music, mm -hmm. you know, the big bands. Uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, uh, Earl Hines, uh, just a lot of, you know, a lot of bands, Fletcher Henderson. So this is stuff he listened to and this was the stuff he played. Yes. You know, and uh, I didn't, I mean, it just, I was playing, we, as you're aware of, classical music to a large degree. The things I listened to were one thing in high school, in junior high, but what I was playing was either concert band, one ensemble, or uh, symphonic, symphonic music, 
And so I had a, I didn't, you know, the big band thing, I didn't really quite get. I, mm. I didn't get the beauty of it. I see. You know, and so I kind of understand it. And I didn't really get, I mean, the bebop and stuff I listen to, but I, it's, it's, it comes now, I didn't understand what makes it beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so it'd be nice to have those conversations now. But, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, I do appreciate that he was, he didn't force me to practice. And he had a different discipline on his instrument and that he really didn't like to practice. He didn't like to practice. No. He, I understand that. Yeah, but he didn't, he didn't like to. He liked to play? He liked to play. And, uh, you know, the things he did in his world, you know, uh, what he brought to it when it was time to, to do it was, su- was sufficient. Yes. Our world, it's, I don't know about other people, but it, I think you got to be on uh, to a greater degree, which yes. means preparation. You know, it's just a, a, a more, a less. they're less tolerable of what you bring to it personally than what you bring to it in an uh, abstract kind of classical music sense if that makes any that's understandable so he didn't like have the discipline like if we were preparing for an audition for instance how we would you know prepare the parts through uh, through study through practice and then consider a daily routine you know to have it be at a certain level so you know I can respect that I mean it's most of the people in the world don't do what we do. They're, you know, aren't as neurotic and, you know, as far as um, how this can try to drive you insane in a way. Uh huh. You know, uh, this, do you feel you often walk on the edge of uh, sanity or insanity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, maybe it's just me personally, but. Uh, you know, this, the, the perfection, I think the notion for perfection drives a lot of, what I want to say, classical musicians, you know, to uh, distraction, you know, to, or to, to something, you know, just this, the notion of having to be perfect or having to be a hundred percent uh, especially if you're a solo player mm-hmm. you know, in, a, in an orchestra. The, you know, the, uh, the pressure of that. Let me ask you this. Um, in relation to that, there's what you've just said, and then there's the aspect, I, I guess I'd like to know to what degree percentage-wise, in terms of making one crazy, there's what you described, and then there's also... The pressure, it's, it's one thing, the pressure, if you have a job, yeah. you know, right. say if you played in the Philly, if you had a full, full-time job, you played in the Philharmonic. There's a whole nother thing, if you're a freelance musician and you have to show up in situations where you may not know anybody, you may know everybody. You may know everybody, but nobody there is your friend. So you, you, you have to play very well then, too. You know, at least right. in an orchestra. Well, yeah. Even if they're not your friend, you have tenure. So you still have to play, but you have tenure. Mm-hmm. So do you feel the uh, freelance thing also contributes to uh, this uh, sense of uh, craziness? And, and to me, in that vein, it's, you don't even have to be a classical musician. You can be a commercial musician. But you still have to show up and throw down pretty much the first time. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's pressures. You know, freelance is uh, just by its very nature is uh, unpredictable and it's competitive, and all those things contribute to you know uh, unsettling your emotional state. I mean, depending on the kind of person you are, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and you, you have to studio world you have to uh, perform produce uh, even live 
It doesn't have to be studio. Yeah, I mean, even live, you I know, mean, freelance work. It's all pressure packed. I mean, there, I think though there's some, uh, it's, you know, the orchestra is a different bag, especially like you say, freelance, because music requires that you're able, doesn't require this, but you'll find in life, and I don't, you know, or I have found that the more I play with like an individual or an ensemble or a group, the more comfortable you become at it. And then the more you understand what the guy on your right and the guy on your left, how they phrase, how they breathe, uh, even where they study, you know, with whom they study, you begin to understand then how to fit in. Mm -hmm. And that's been like the crazy part is going from one orchestra to the next to another, which is good. And playing, you're playing literature, which is generally understood and uh, approached the same way, you know, amongst the various orchestras. But there's slight differences as far as, again, phrasing, uh, slight interpretive differences, and just in the way people play. So if you're not given the opportunity to play with a group steadily for, let's say, a given period of time, maybe you'd say a year, mm -hmm. as opposed you know, to coming in every six months and playing with them, that kind of plays havoc to some degree with your confidence or with well, what should I be doing? Yes. Because you know, when you play with, after a year, you kind of know what you should be doing. I, you know. And to, to just be a little clearer for some of the people who may be watching, when you're talking about going into these groups, you're, you're actually talking about groups that have a roster. Right. Right. And you're going in as a extra or a sub. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. it's different. At least for me, it's slightly different if everybody is if, if it's a pickup orchestra and everybody's showing up right. for that gig from all over Southern California, as opposed to walking into a group yeah. to be the tuba player where they have a tuba player, but he's not doing it that concert. That's a different stress. That is different. That's a different stress because you have, um, I guess we, we put on ourselves, you know, the, uh, Perhaps they don't think anything of it. I'm sure some people are listening, and some people, you know, you have to fill certain shoes, and uh, there's certain expectations. Do, do you, you say perhaps some people are listening? You're just yeah. being... Uh, well, I'm trying to be positive. You know, um, another guy who I'm going to interview is Michael Vlakovich, and his deal is, what he says is, in Los Angeles, every time you play, it's an audition. Because... Mm -hmm you don't know where your next work is coming from yeah. and people are listening all the time, uh -huh. whether they let you know or not. And, uh, I ascribe to that. Well, you're right. They're listening. Um, but I, for me, I think that I start, I've learned that that puts more pressure on me. Mm -hmm. I realize they're listening, but sometimes I'm not going to second guess everything. You know, I'm going to say, let me just go and play. And maybe some people don't give a damn, you know, uh, I mean, they want it right, and they want it accurate, and they want it musical. But perhaps, you know, I don't need to put the pressure of an audition on me, you know, when I when I do some of these gigs, you know. And understanding, though, you especially playing with new people, you want to put your best foot forward in and, uh, and, and new situations or with people who are extremely well-established in the music industry and either have had very wonderful careers in terms of the work they've done or in terms of perhaps the income they've generated for themselves. And so in front of these people, we, we want to do the best. But sometimes, you know, I'm trying, especially I'm 58 years old, you know, I don't have too much to lose by being loose, you know, when I go into a situation and not really putting undue pressure on myself mm -hmm. in terms of what, you know, think, what people think, or second guessing myself, you know. So it's it's a learning process, and it, like I say, there's pressure. There's always going to be pressure, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, especially you know 
we're playing a score and everything is exactly, it's, it's laid out, it's a road map, it's been that way for 200 years. And um, there's very little room for uh, error, error and, there's, and deviation. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that's my life, I've accepted it. And uh, the funny thing, it, it seems to be getting in a way better, you know. The situations or how you approach the situation? I approach it, you know, just I feel better. You know, I went through therapy two or three years ago because of my nerves. In playing situations? Right, playing situations. Uh, I think um, a lot of folks just don't realize how crazy it can be. Well, I, yeah. And musicians, a lot of musicians don't, don't acknowledge themselves mm -hmm. how crazy See, the wonder, situation can make them. I wonder about that. I wonder about, maybe there are people, everyone's wired a certain way. So I say, well, maybe they're wired a certain way, like a jet pilot, you know, who's wired a certain way with nerves and with intellect, you know, to, you know, to, to fly a jet, uh, to, you know, uh, to, to learn how to do it, to go to school for it, to, to f operate the machine, to take off and land something that is incredibly dangerous, you know, that uh, like a commercial pilot, you know, if he crashed, would maybe involve the lives of hundreds of people. So I'm thinking, well, maybe some of our musician friends are wired a certain way, just like these jet pilots, and nothing, things don't bother them. They have, you know, their, their intellect helps them, their nerves. But I think, to, and I think you're right. I think that's probably a minority. I'd say a lot of people are, have the same kind of insecurities or concerns, you know, as far as uh, how am I playing? Do I sound okay? And they. You know, however you deal with it is one, you know, I mean, I heard people taking beta blockers and that's not, you know, that's not uh, that uncommon, which is the, uh, the blood pressure medication, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or doing whatever they do or engaging in meditation or doing something to find a way around the, the, the stress, you know, of what we do. I want to, um, I want to stop here for a moment. And uh, you just used an example of airline pilots. Right. We're pretty cool on time. Okay. I see you're looking at your watch. <laughs> I'm curious. It's been 32 minutes, 51 seconds. I want to get a glass of a sip of water. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, get up and get some water, Mr. Mitchell. I'll keep talking. And uh, so you use the airplane thing, life and death, that kind of thing. Right. And I want to explore a little bit, or I'd like you to think out loud a little bit. You know, art, making art, music, for folks who are not artists, I don't know if they always get to the degree to which, and it's, it's different for each artist too. But in playing music, I find in playing music that for that moment, for that piece, whether, whether I'm playing Prokofiev or whether I'm improvising freely or playing an arrangement of Duke Ellington. For that moment, everything really depends on me and everyone involved creating that piece of work. Everything depends on me. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of pressure to play the right note, to play it at the right time, to place it just perfectly, to uh, try to catch what the conductor means by the sweep of her baton. If you're playing by yourself or you're playing in a small ensemble, you know, if it's a B flat and you play a B natural, there's some issues for everybody, yeah. not just the people playing, not even for the audience, but for the harmony of the spheres, you know? Exactly, yeah. If it's a B flat and you just play, and you play it sharp, you're not even playing another note, but you play it sharp or you play it flat. Well, in fact, you are playing another note, you know, in relation to 
the instruments you're playing with around you. Um, in a sense, I mean, no one's gonna die like if a pilot messes up. Right. But the composer dies a little bit. Yeah, and you always you know. sure did. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was a really good screw up. Yeah. 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 Now, I want to, um, we may have to do another one of these because this is taking a bit of time. I want to go back. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you took lessons at Grant, Grant Music Center? Yep. Uh, right. Okay, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about, because this series, one of the main parts of this series is it's about Los Angeles and what goes on in Los Angeles and unlike maybe a lot of folks who might end up on this series, you have been here for a long time. Um, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about Grant Music Center, not so much about the center necessarily, you can yeah. put it how you want, but if the neighborhoods you grew up in, okay. you know, that milieu, how those neighborhoods supported you or didn't support you, what was happening in those times. Like you and I, as I recall, met in the police band, right. the LAPD junior band. Yeah. Now, people can't see me, but they can see you. You're an African-American, and uh, actually so am I. And we're talking about the late 60s, right? Right. And LAPD band, that was just after the era of Chief William Parker. Right. You know, that band was not, uh, well, just LAPD is, was not a shining beacon of encouragement and hope, in my neighborhood anyway. Yet I marched in that band and so did you. And uh, under Horde, Officer Paul Horde, right, yeah. who was also African-American. But I remember, I don't know if you remember, but I, I remember there was some animosity towards him by older members of the band, because um, he had replaced a guy who didn't look like him. Yeah. I think that guy's name was Kelly, Officer yeah. Kelly. Anyway, um, yeah, so you grew up in South Central pretty much, right? Or yeah. Central Central? After the riot, everything was South Central. Yeah, it's, uh, that term, I don't remember it, well, being used until uh, later, I guess in the 70s, really. But, uh, after the riot, they called everything Watts. Everything was Watts. Right? South of downtown. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's how I kind of we looked at it, you know, in a way. Um, but yeah, I grew up on 107th Street, and uh, what was the what was the major cross street? Uh, Figueroa. Figueroa. Yeah, the, one of the longest streets in the world, Figueroa. Yeah, and that's the heart of the ghetto. 107th and Figueroa. Uh, that's... Pretty much, yeah. I mean, uh, surprisingly, though, we moved there in, uh, I think, the fall of 62. And, you know, there were actually, I don't I don't know the demographics, you know, numerically, but there were quite a few uh, white people mm -hmm. living in the area at the time. Um, like we had neighbors like across the street, uh, next to a neighbor, were older white people. Uh, it was probably, white flight had probably, you know, been underway uh, for, you know, at least 15 or 20 years prior yeah. to you know, the exodus. You have to be able to move. Yeah. I mean, after, so, but there was still a residual, I guess, of older white people who were still in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, that, that's, I look back on it, that's kind of interesting in a way, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of my best friends was a uh, kid, white kid. It was probably one of the last at our elementary school. Uh -huh. One of the last white students there. Mm -hmm. And um, but they moved around. Uh, I think they moved after the riots. How do you think it was for him before the riots? Oh, it was screwed up, man. It was screwed uh -huh. up. You know, he got picked on. And um, you know, like I say... Uh, he was a minority, you know, and actually, you know, so I guess it was sort of like a, when you're the minority, how you get picked on. 
Yeah. You know, so. But it was an interesting, it was, you know, uh, interesting neighborhood. It's a lot different now. How so? Well, the demographics have changed. You know, have gone from like, uh, we're there, you don't, you know, it's relative mixed to some degree then to be exclusively probably uh, African American. Now it's pretty much exclusively Latino over mm -hmm. to a, a great deal. Like uh, the high school that you and I went to is. What high school was that? It's Lock High. Uh huh. Built, uh, built in 1967. On 110th uh, in Avalon. Yeah. And the, probably the enrollment when, yeah, at that time would be like about 98% black, African-American, and maybe a very small Latino population. And that's probably, I imagine, about 60% Latino now. But so it's changed, but music, Let me ask you something uh, about Lock High School. Sure. When we were going to Lock High School, right. we were in a classroom, a harmony class, and the harmony teacher, his name was Reggie Andrews, Right. Some people might know him. Uh -huh. Played with Willie Bobo, yes. among other people. Uh, and uh, he was just going through the, the class lesson. Then he stopped. Yeah. You remember that? You're laughing. I'll try to remember this. I, uh, I know where you're going with this. Yeah. He stopped and he said, this, this ties into the things you've said before. Yeah. He said, Bill Roper, Joseph Mitchell, why do you play the music of dead white people? Do you remember that? I vaguely, you know, vaguely. Um, Only vaguely? You know, it's some, it doesn't, it stand, I mean, I kind of remember this, not one of the things that stand out. Uh, but I, I knew where you're going because I remember, you know, it had come up. And, you know, that's a good question. And, well, let me interrupt you for a minute. <laughs> I was shocked. And I was speechless. <laughs> you you formulated an answer for him. Do you remember that? I can't remember that. <laughs> yeah, you formulated an answer for him. So now tell us why you think it's a good question. Well, it you know, I just uh, it's provocative. You know, it's a provocative question, and uh, you know that's that's a good thing to ask. It's good to challenge people. You know, and uh, I'm glad I came up, at least try, attempted an answer, uh, as feeble I'm sure as it was, but, uh, you know, I, I guess you kind of wonder why he asked, what's his motivation for asking it? You know, was he uh, trying to uh, be demeaning or something, you know, or uh, to prove something? I don't know. Everyone else in the class thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. Well, it's a kind of humorous statement. I guess, you know, it's a humorous thing. But, you know, 40 years makes a big difference in uh, how you look at things, uh, what you like and what you don't like, how you enjoy things. I says, you know what? That's the best thing, you know. That means I was on the right track. It means you were on the right track? Yeah. You mean that he asked it well, or yeah, that, that you that, tried to answer it? That he asked it. Uh -huh. That means I was I was doing the right thing, and that if someone either wanted to he was provoked or wanted to provoke us, you know, by asking it. But it, it, it meant it meant some, he, it was a challenge in a way, uh -huh. and so it meant that we were doing first of all something. I imagine that, and you know this though, that was not the norm. It isn't the norm now. Mm -hmm. Any given symphony orchestra in the United States, if there's five percent black people playing in it, uh, that's a huge. You got number. something special. That's a big number, unless it's uh, southeast, or you know something. No, we're talking about, but a different level. Another level, right? If there are, I'm only two percent. You know, if a group is a hundred people. If you have uh, two to four African American there that's pretty good that's that's the numbers they have downtown mm -hmm. you know at any given time maybe there's four black people in that you know playing in that group so that means we were we were we were onto something we were doing something um, 
out of the ordinary at the time. Even, like I said, even today, out of the ordinary. You know? And I I don't think he meant any hostility. He, he may have just been messing with us. I think he was messing with us. Yeah. Was, he had a good time. Yeah, it was just, just messing with us, you know? Uh, I've had a good time with it since. Yeah. You know, I use that line as often as I can. He, you know, I mean, it, it, that was just him having some fun. I mean, I guess he had to do something to break up the monotony. Hmm. But uh, that was one of my greatest experiences being in that class. That Why? Because of, of harmony? Because yeah, it was harmony? Because it was harmony. I mean, I wanted to ask you uh, one of the questions I had prepared. This deals with you as a composer, which we haven't right. talked a lot about. Um, so I'm going to move it in that direction because there's not that much time left. Now, as a composer, as an improviser, yeah. do uh, does harmony strike you as a tyrant? Does it does it enter your life as a composer in a tyrannical kind of way, or is it just a tool you use when you want to use, or do you feel intimidated by it? Do you understand the nature of my question? Yeah. Um, I do. And I think the fortunate thing with uh, uh, 20th, 20th century music is that it opened up, uh, you know, it opened up more avenues for you to create without harmony without the need for a strict set of uh, uh, progressions. Mm, functional. Yeah, functional harmony. Uh-huh. I mean, and so we can thank classical musicians for that. We can thank classical composers. We can thank uh, Debussy for uh, letting us deal with instead of chords that are uh, progression operating on uh, movements of uh, you know, strong root movement of a fourth and fifth, and then modulation to uh, either remote, either neighboring keys or remote keys, and going through all that process. We can simply play our, uh, a series of uh, parallel chords as a great expressive device. Uh, like we can thank Sati for that kind of stuff. Um, we can thank, I guess, to some degree, people like uh, uh, you know John Cage. He was pretty strict, but you know, he had some chances. He was strict to, about some other stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, know, you know, so, and then we can understand what I've become to understand that harmony is just harmony. Chords are just chords. Unfortunately, there's been a dogma of like common practice harmony, and that's what they teach in schools. And that's the first thing you learn, which I don't understand. I always think teach the students the current kind of stuff that mm -hmm. goes on mm -hmm. and then go backwards don't try to get them to start working with obsolete something obsolete. that's 200 years old or, or, yeah just I mean it's beautiful I'm not going to tell you it's not beautiful I'm, and I'm not going to tell you that uh, there's nothing to learn from there's a lot to learn from it uh, Bach was is Every time I play Bach or listen to Bach, I learn something. And every, you know, same with Mozart. But he wasn't concerned with that, right? But it was—that's two hundred years ago, you know. Uh, yeah. Now let me be a little uh, semi-controversial here. Uh, a lot of what you've just said, can't you also apply to jazz harmony? Well, you can, but. Uh, yeah, because... It, I mean, that's very codified, too. It, it strikes is. me. It, and you uh, can pay high prices for calling yourself a jazz musician and deviating from it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's... Be, I don't know why that... Well, yeah, that's even a harder... They take even a harder line. It's, it's even more, really? You know, I, I feel the same way. I, I feel they're more conservative, actually, yeah. than and, classical conservatives. I, I mean, I don't get it. I don't particularly understand it. Um, well, I, I guess yeah, I just see it as it's, there's a process, uh, you know, that people, this is what they want to hear or this is what they want to play. I, I, parts well, of but what say. about the, that's one, players are one thing, audiences are one thing, but 
you deal with the academy, you deal with institutions. Yeah. Do or don't they have an obligation to be uh, more open and be seeking well, not only their time, but the future? Sort of do. I mean, by the very nature, those places are, uh, they are uh, designed to be in an enclosed world in a way. I mean, that's what it's all about is uh, it, openness is in the, you know, certain academies. That's not at all, you know, it's, it's being a cloister. And, um, you know, that's kind of what you can expect from that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I think they're missing the point because I've gone through this for years. I I wanted to improvise. I was curious about, let's call it a tonal improvisation in jazz for high school. And I would ask people, I says, when you improvise, uh, how do you know what to play? Or you know, how do you know this? And I, you know, I can't remember, remember what people told me, but one thing was, was well, you have a set of chord changes and then you have a set of scales, and then you develop ideals uh, based on those two parameters, the chords and the scales, and then you make music. And you know, I said, wow. So then I spent not a lot of time, but some time, you know, getting, I got a fake book, and you kind of go through the, the chords, and you kind of learn the associated scales, but then you begin to find out and this is only recently, that um, the, the, imp the people we respect as improvisers, sometimes they don't give a damn about the chords. And what they play is independent of the chords. Mm -hmm. They're not really confused. Mm -hmm. Because, um, I mean, this way they approach improvisation now through, you know, uh, through a, you know, a sort of a, like at this college level, well, I don't. That's not necessarily how they played, like in the fifties and maybe in the sixties. This, this relatively new thing, you know, that you go to school, you learn jazz harmony. You know, I mean, it's it's good to know but the people who you really like to hear play. Sometimes they're playing with the chord, and sometimes they're playing quite against it. Mm -hmm. And that's the way a lot of music has always been. It's it's. You know, that's why we have a passing tone, non-core tone, because you're playing against it and in, independent of what the harmony is. So I think this harmonic, this dogma of harmony, it doesn't stand up to practice. Because, I mean, if you listen to the, the jazz artists who are well-respected and for whom people have a, you know, a tremendous appreciation and admiration for their work, uh, it flies in the face of. Uh, so it's it's uh, typical. The rules are based on past practice, as opposed to absolute. I, but then they they get. Yeah. I think the rules codified. are based on uh, who's ever, you know, whoever has whoever the stick at the them, moment. Right, whoever whoever is setting them up, whoever the critic is, you know, mm -hmm. now, because. Uh, you know, the chord extension, I mean, that takes, when you start playing those things, you're often another, you're playing against the chords. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I, you know. Well, talk at this point then a little bit about your compositions, what they're about, how you approach it. You, at least the ones I've played, there's a lot of improvisation. Right. In most of them, how how do you set up those improvisational structures? Yeah. How to what brings you to write a piece? You have done a lot of pieces that employ text, you know, either sung or yeah. spoken word, um, or even if the text is not in the piece. Quite often, it seems to me it's part of the generative process yeah. of the piece. So, just take a while and. Uh, you got about five minutes. Talk about your work, how you approach it, just how whatever you want to say about it. Well, um, it's hard to explain. No, it's, it's not really hard to explain. Uh, I I write something when I'm motivated by by uh, something. Like so, literature motivates me to uh, uh, 
to some degree or to a large degree, you know, uh, like poetry will motivate me, or just literature, you know, will inspire, or some event in my life will inspire me to write something. Um, I'm not really a trained composer as far as, uh, again, as what one might, you know, uh, encounter in a academic setting. But when I write, I do try to, I am trained, well, the limited training that I have, I try to exploit to the fullest. Uh, so uh, I try to exploit like 20th century compositional techniques. And uh, then I try to exploit the things I hear that I've heard in my past that I like. So one of the groups that I really enjoy listening to, like when I was in college, under, undergraduate studying, was the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Uh, four members uh, using uh, trumpet, woodwinds, percussion uh, would engage in uh, spontaneous and free improvisation. Do you know their names? Yeah, it was uh, Don Moyer, mm -hmm. was percussion, uh, Joseph Jarman, mm -hmm. uh, I think he's woodwinds and percussion, Roscoe Mitchell would be woodwinds, and Lester Bowie on trumpet. Mm -hmm. And the Art Ensemble of Chicago was a huge influence upon how I think about music. And what was it about them? Uh, it was well. It was about the freedom with with which they played, and as you were, and the freedom from chordal or harmonic dominance. So the group is pianoless. Mm -hmm. It's act. It's pianoless. It's, there's no uh, fretted instruments, which we usually think of as a rhythm section. Yes. The only rhythm section instrument was the, the drum set. Mm -hmm. you know? So people, so it's a linear uh, texture. You know, it's, it's driven by um, you know, linear movement and contrapuntal ideas. Uh, you may have some sort of stack things, but it, you know, improvisation was a, a conversation between one another, and then understanding the role of each person within, let's say, a given piece, uh, as far as support or uh, being uh, the statement. You know, being able to those that would make a statement uh, was intriguing to me. You know, just the way they operate, and more than that, the sound that they get. Uh, you know, that's what I like, you know, freedom of it, but more how they, their minds work, spontaneously creating something, not uh, driven by uh, what we generally consider common harmonic practice, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, things we discussed earlier. So when I'm writing certain improvis improvisatory things in my pieces, I'm considering how they approach it. And it has nothing to do with like technique in a way. It has to do more with how you think and how much you enjoy what you're doing. You know? So I use those elements. Um, you know, there may be some melodic ideas I have, and then even in some pieces, some harmonic ideas because I do like the sound of what's called the, the Lydian, uh, either the Lydian mode or chords built uh, at, with what we call the sharp 11, the raised fourth degree. It's just an interesting sound to me. Um, but a lot of my earlier compositions were uh, used the musicians. The rhythmic flow and the structure is dependent upon how musicians are thinking at a particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or how, if I'm using poetry, how the words flow with a given speaker, not necessarily. So the music is fluid. Yeah, it's fluid. In performance. You, you try to have it fluid and it, uh, you want a certain spontaneity. And, but you, you want to exploit to the, you know, the, the greatest degree how people think about music outside of uh, har harmonic structures and even structures of a form. You know, how, how are you gonna put a piece together without dealing with uh, 
a necessarily a, a binary form or something like that. You know, how are you going to put a piece together? So that's uh, pretty much my approach had been for, to some degree, I, you know, this part of it's like just living in the 20th century, you know, uh, and how you approach music. Now, I've, I've been writing some things now based on uh, chord progressions. Is that because we're in the 21st century now? No, that's, you know, that's just where I started ahead. I just wanted to say, see, well, what would it be like to do that? Because melody, I, I enjoy melody. You know, it doesn't mean I don't, and, you know, I, I enjoy the, the how composers put together melodic statements, irrespective of uh, what chords they use, but how the design of a, of a line, it, it's really a beautiful thing. So I, you know, I like that. And uh, so well, I'll try to, I mean, I, I don't totally cast off, you know, uh, chord changes and such, because there's some nice things you can do with them once you understand you don't have to be a servant to them, that they should serve you. And there's a lot to learn about them. You know, you, you, know, you, you can't, you don't want to like be deficient and learn. I'm still learning about jazz theory, frankly. Because it wasn't taught in school, you know. But it's a very, you know, it, it's not that, it's, um, there isn't that, it's not a mystery. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very straightforward. It's based on triadic principles, just extending it further. But my compositions are, uh, you know, some are uh, improvisatory. Uh, the poetry, um, there's such an affinity between uh, poetry and music. And so for a while, I was trying to do the poems of uh, Arna Bontem, the Harlem Renaissance uh, writer. And because I liked his work, you know, and just the things he was saying. And I, I you, know, you try to wonder, how. Well, how could I put this this let's poetry into uh, um, how can I express what he's saying with words through music, and how can I combine the two, and how can I put his spirit of uh, of the Harlem Renaissance and being a black man in America, you know, in, into this music, and how can I get maybe other people to find something in it that they might enjoy? So I that's the that's project's been on hold and I haven't done anything recently. But maybe I set about four of his poems to music and uh, you know, just start try to do the best with it. Uh, that's pretty much my, you know, comp I'm just, you know, going, I'm being a person who composes somewhat in infrequently and without the kind of training that a lot of composers have, um, it's, a, it's a very slow process, but I'm still learning. And I was actually very, so I was encouraged. I was going through some old notebooks and I found three tunes that I had written. Uh, and now I'm going to ready to do another CD. You know, so uh, it, it's very encouraging. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to working on those. I, you know, perhaps one day I'll, I keep telling myself, you know, you, need, you can learn something by writing uh, something on Sonata Allegro. It mm -hmm. may take you, 15 years, you know, and it's... Do you have 15 years left? I don't think so. I got, let's see, maybe. I don't maybe. have 15, I don't if have 15 you're optimistic. years to do that. Uh -huh. you, know, I, I, you know, I'm just like saying, uh, it, you know, it would take too long to really, cause it's been, to really do it like it should be done, you know, so well, I don't have that time, but I do have the time that maybe you know, uh, listen to uh, listen to Mozart or something. I mean, it's been done. You know that, uh, but to maybe work harder at getting better, and maybe doing some of the quote unquote traditional things. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of it, but not a lot. You know. Well, speaking of time, we're going to have to come back and do this again because there's a lot of stuff we haven't gotten into, but. We have hit our time limit, and I know that uh, being a freelance musician, you have a gig you have to get to. I have a gig. Which is why you're on this part of the side I of town. I have a gig, and I left my music <laughs> on the chair. I didn't leave it at home. 
<laughs> See, this is that nerve wracking stuff. I was going to bring it home because I was told, you don't have to worry about this. It's sight readable. Man, these chords are going about 100 beats per minute, one chord after the next, three note chords. This is stuff I need to, in my brain. Chords, so you're playing melodic percussion? Yeah, I'm playing vibes. Uh huh. And I was going to bring the music home and maybe squeeze in 15 minutes of looking at those chords. So now I'm hoping the music is either on that chair or the librarian picked it up. Oh, I see. So you left it at the site. I left it at the site. Oh, um, I see. But yeah, that's the. Don't let anybody ever tell you uh, it's sight readable because uh, I don't know about them, but I know about me. And me. me well, as too. you said to me once, after I said made a little statement, you said it's amazing what other people think you need. I can't. Well, I wish I'd sure uh, remembered that earlier this week. But I was, uh, you know, this. Uh, I was bought. I had was time constraints, as you know, we have said. So. Yeah. But we'll make the best of it. What are you playing? That uh, what? What is that part? That it's a vibraphone part. Yeah, I may be a little. For bit. what piece? It's uh, a. The program is uh, Gershwin music. It's ah. Probably a Gershwin vocal number. Ah. An arrangement. And it's, I'm, I think sometimes I micromanage myself. You know, I got to give myself a little credit to be able to play this, but it, Well, I, every time you play, it's an audition. That's right. You know, it's, it's- You can determine whether you work next week or not. It does, it's or not next gonna, year. No matter how easy it is, it's not gonna play itself, you know? So there you have it. Okay, well, we're gonna wrap this up because I don't want you uh, being angry. I'm we good. want want to thank you, Mr. Mitchell, and we'll have you back because okay. we have, uh, other things to go into. Okay, it's my pleasure, and I'll see you next time. All right, say hallelujah. <laughs>